This story takes place a couple of weeks, maybe a month after I had arrived at High Desert State Prison, early in my incarceration. We had come off of lockdown, and I had struck up a friendship with a skinhead named Vertigo, who had been very considerate and even kind towards me. He was a homeboy. In prison vernacular, this means that he originated from the same county, or perhaps a hometown, that I did, that we came from the same place. And it makes for a strong bond because you can talk about things outside of prison. You can talk about places you've been, big things that happened in town. I recall mentioning a formative event of my childhood whenever the library in my hometown had burnt down, and he remembered hearing about it. While I had appreciated the consideration that Vertigo had shown me, I was a little uncomfortable around him because I did not share his ideological beliefs. But as I considered the situation, I realized that I didn't actually know what his ideological beliefs were. Yes, he had a bunch of stupid, offensive, racist skinhead tattoos. And yes, he had a bunch of skinhead friends. But if I looked at the situation, I was just thinking I was enjoying hanging out with the skinheads. Because in an institutional environment, a violent prison environment, Groups that emphasize group loyalty and physical readiness to protect the people you love? That kind of logic makes sense. It does. And even if I didn't agree with everything that they stood for, it would be nice to be a member of a group, and maybe that's what he decided too. If I didn't know who he was, it didn't seem fair to judge him, so I made a resolution. I was going to distance from the skinheads. I'd spent a lot of time with them in the past two days. I guess you could say I had a bunch of stupid skinhead friends. And if I hung out with them for a third day in the row and continued to do this, at some point I'd just be a member of their group, the same as I was judging Vertigo for being. Even without the tattoos, the guy that hangs out with the skinheads all day long probably hasn't really considered whether he wants to be a member of the group, whether he wants to reflect their values. I didn't want to be a member of the group, I didn't want to reflect their values, so I would distance from them, but not from Vertigo. He'd been kind to me, he seemed like a decent dude, and I was going to operate under the assumption he didn't really stand for the stuff that he had tattooed on him. That he was like me, he was just trying to fit in, and he'd ended up in a place, and he didn't know how to get out of it. So. That evening, I already had a little list of things I had to do when we had day room. I told my downstairs neighbor, John, I was going to place cards with him. I wanted to get on the phone, and I wanted to get a shower if I could. These are the activities that are available to you in the day room. And I, I'd add one more to the list, that I would take the time to try and pull Vertigo to the side and have a real conversation with him, because I liked him. Maybe he could be a friend, but we had to have this conversation before I could really consider him anything other than that skinhead that I knew in prison. I decided that I'd have the conversation with him around the end of day room, around day room recall, because there'd be fewer people out. It would be private. It's funny, the little choices that we make in life, and you have to wonder what would have been different if I tried it the other way. What if I'd said it was important? So I wanted to talk to him early in day room instead of, well, it's private, so I'll talk to him later in day room. I don't know what would have happened. I was in the shower whenever the alarm went off. I was in the shower whenever it went to hell. And everybody in the day room hit the ground whenever the officers started screaming, prone out, get down right now. You see, when every officer carries an alarm. It's a little box, a bit bigger than a pager, and all it is is a button. And if they press that button, a couple of things happen immediately. An electronic signal is sent to the central control room in a different part of the prison. And they get a little light that flashes that says, this button, meaning the alarm that officer has, was pressed at this place in the prison. And it shows up on their little board where the alarm is. And the officer in there gets on the microphone and announces, Code 1 in B3. Code 1 in B3. This is shorthand for the officers, and you'll hear it anywhere in the prison. What it means is Code 1. Everybody respond. This is an emergency. Get there. B3. That's a B yard, Bravo yard, the yard I was. Three block, the building I was. 
you hear this alarm if it happens anywhere on the yard, but it was in my building, and as I looked, there was no fight. Yes, the officers were yelling, that's their job, but I didn't know why the alarm had went off. I looked up in the tower at the gunner, and DeWall was ready. He had his gun at arms, and he was looking around for, I guess, whoever he's supposed to shoot, not to put it too bluntly, but he's there to save or end lives. He's a gunner. And nobody seemed to know what was going on. The officers were quickly going from person to person, taking control of the situation. Get down on the ground now! Prone out! They're confident in this duty because whenever that alarm went off, whenever the person on the mic said, Code 1, B3, on the institutional PA, and everybody heard it, every officer on that yard came sprinting to B3. So the cops taking control of the situation, putting everybody on the ground, they know it's going to be 20 seconds, 30 seconds before they have an officer or two to back them up. And 30 seconds after that, it'll be two or three more. And within three minutes, there's going to be 40 of them available in there to take control of the situation. I'm in the shower. So whenever, instead of all of the officers coming running in three or four at a time, the goon squad comes in, the riot squad, I'm glad to be in the shower because things are getting real. Something's going down. Um, the goon squad is 20 officers, full riot gear. They've got the shields that come like this that you can see through. They've got helmets that come over their face, again, that they can see through so they have a nice clear line of sight. And they have a nice long baton. And they walk forward all in line and just beat the hell out of anybody their way if things go bad. They're to control the situation. And as soon as they arrived, you hear their cadence as they're running, because they, they run all one step, one step, one step. It's thunk, 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 thunk. And you have the alarm going in the background, nice and loud. And they start strip searching inmates as they're proned out there on the ground. Whenever you're proned out, you're supposed to put your face nice and against the concrete so that you're uncomfortable. And then you put your arms back behind you like this. And then you cross your feet and twist them outward. The purpose of this is to make it impossible for you to stand up without kind of doing a whole movement. And if an officer sees you doing that, he'll come over and put his knee in your chest and put your face back down on the concrete. That's his job. Getting strip searched in the shower is pretty dang easy, honestly. An officer came by and he just looked at the clothes they had hanging up on the shower door. And he went through them and looked me up and down. And I guess that's a strip search. It's not like I had anything hit, or if I did, it's not like he wanted to look for it. But while this was happening, I look out in the day room and I saw Vertigo getting patted down while he's proned out. And the officer pulled out a nice knife called over another member of the squad. They put it in a bag, put vertigo in handcuffs. Before I had my clothes back on, they had one more skinhead, they had a knife they got, and two other guys that they gaffled up, and I don't know why they didn't appear to have any weapons on them. Put on my clothes that are called the dare room, and that was the last time I saw vertigo. I actually asked my mom whenever I started filming this part of these videos, thinking about Vertigo, if she remembered him. And she said that she remembered just barely that she'd had a friend or maybe a customer who, was it her brother? Yeah, her brother was in prison. And she remembered that, but she didn't remember who. So I imagine, I'll never know how Vertigo's story ended, but uh, Vertigo, if you're out there, thank you for what you did for me. And I've decided that I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that I'm going to assume you are a decent person who happened to have been in a bad situation and made some bad friends. As I think about it, the fact of the matter is, there were two knives out in the day room that evening. And it's really possible that they were meant for me. Maybe not, I'm not saying they were, but I sure didn't know what was going on, and something was. Maybe it had nothing to do with me. Maybe uh, Vertigo was, you know, he owed some money and he was cleaning up some dirty owed. Maybe he had to stab somebody to earn some ink to fit in with his gang. Maybe he was cleaning up the building. Maybe there was a rat on the building and they needed to get rid of him. Except then I think, I was a rat. Just a couple of weeks earlier, I'd 
informed on people at San Quentin. I hadn't went to staff, but I had went behind the shot callers back. I had lied and schemed. I, I hadn't done it for personal profit as such. I did it because I thought it was the right thing. But those things really don't matter, and I had felt like I walked out of reception about one day ahead of getting hit. It's way possible that the shot caller decided he was taking things a little more personally than I thought, and a kite followed me to high desert. Maybe not, I don't know, but I've decided I'd rather give Vertigo the benefit of the doubt. It didn't have anything to do with me at all. Or if it did, well... The officers came in for a reason. Goon Squad was ready for a reason. This wasn't a random search. They don't do this type of thing randomly that often in prison. Somebody told them what was going on. They knew to go in and search that evening. So if it was about me, I'm going to choose to believe that somebody who knew what was going on had informed the staff that I was in trouble and that they needed to get some knives and some problem inmates off the yard. In fact, I'm going to choose to believe that the somebody who did that was lying prone out on the ground and ended up picking a shoe term for a piece in his belt, rather than have to be the guy that stabbed me. And he did this in the only way he could think of to not betray his gang. Or none of this. That's the thing about prison. You don't ever actually know what happened. You just know what you saw, what you experienced. But I suppose that life in general is you don't ever know anything. You just go through your days and you do the absolute best that you can and you try to give people the benefit of the doubt when you can. I'm giving Vertigo the benefit of the doubt. He was a decent guy, he tried to help me and uh, it's just a bad situation in a bad place. I'm not suggesting that if I ran into him tomorrow, I'm going to invite him over for a barbecue, and I'm not suggesting anybody should trust without using their reasoning faculties, without trying to decide really carefully what's safest for them, not just what's kindest for the person they're trying to trust. But if you can, if it's safe, and if you can bring yourself to do so, try to assume the best about people. It's kinder to them, and in the final analysis, it's kinder to us, too, because nobody wants to walk around assuming the worst of anyone.